Today's guest was born in St Helens in 1951. He started life as a commentator for Radio City and progressed on to be an English TV presenter on Granada TV on programmes such as Rugby League Action. He's worked cup finals, he's covered rugby league, football, he's worked on European Championships, football cup finals, he's even worked the Olympic Games. Born as Roger, but we all know him as Elton Wellesby. Good evening, welcome, Goals of the Day, a regular Saturday night review of all the day's First Division action. And really, we start with a day of quality rather than quantity, supplemented by, well, well one or two that got away. Thank you very much. We did do a, um, a joint Granada Yorkshire production uh, oh gosh early 80s um john helm was always the commentator the lovely john helm and my studio guest was always vinci corelius vince, wow. big vince yeah and <laughs> uh, do you want a quick story about vince yeah yeah, yeah, go ahead. It, yeah. okay well we, we we were doing a game at leeds at headingley and the, the, the director, uh, I think I, I recall his name, is Jeff Hall. Now, he, he was a renowned drinker of whiskey. And John Helm used to say he'd hear in his ear, you know, cut to camera one, cut to camera three, camera five, pass the scotch, <laughs> camera three. <laughs> and, and, and that was Helmy's story. But anyway, this night that we'd done the game in Leeds, we went to a hotel in Leeds, and I, I can't remember the name, but, but it had a casino downstairs. And um, so we, there was Vince, me, and Jeff Hall having a drink upstairs. And Jeff Hall, by this stage, was absolutely paralytic. And he said, I'm going down to the casino, win some money. <laughs> And we went, yeah, all right. And so off he went. Half an hour later, he still hadn't returned. So I said to Vinty, I think we'd better go down and, and check him out. And um, we did. And he was being hassled by four or five, well, jobs, basically. Um, and and I, I sort of said, hey, leave him alone, for God's sake. You know, he's doing no one any harm. Uh, and one of these yobs said to me, um, well, what are you going to do about it? Because <laughs> I'm little, you know. So I said, me? Nothing. And then I pointed to Vinci and said, but he will. <laughs> and they ran out of the casino. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I'm Brilliant not surprised. Stuff. That was probably a wise choice to run away. So we're straight into rugby league then, but what are your earliest memories of rugby league, Elton? Earliest memory? <clears throat> I think I would be about five years of age. And the family always used to gather at my Auntie Ethel's at the end of Elton Head Road, the potteries, the pottery house. And everyone's right there. And there was a conversation going on about rugby league. And Alex Murphy's name came up. And um, I remember my auntie Ethel saying, oh, great player, but uh, he's a cocky young shit. And so the first rugby league player that stuck in my mind was, was the legendary Alex. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I've played golf with him since and uh, done quite a few things with him since, and he's become a good mate. But in 1956, or I think roughly that, it would have been roughly that, you know, I, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know he was going to go and win the Ashes in in, uh, in Australia, you know. Yeah, but, I, um... And then later on in life, <clears throat> we got to know each other through after-dinner speaking and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah. <laughs> We just got on like a house on fire. A great privilege. But I always remember my auntie Ethel saying, 
he's a cocky little shit. <laughs> that so, that's stuck and, in your mind all these years. And, 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 well, to be honest with you, I, I, nothing that I, ever, ever since has changed my mind that she was right. <laughs> <laughs> But the thing was, Alex could back it up, couldn't he, with with his skill set? Yeah, he might have been cocky on the rugby field, but he had he had the credentials to back that up. Oh, listen, Ray French, the great Ray French, international rugby international rugby league. In his autobiography, the the uh, he wrote at the start, the greatest rugby player I've ever seen in union or league was Alex Murphy. Yeah. I mean, say no more. Yeah, yeah he, that's he, a great he, accolade, isn't it? A great accolade. And he's he's got plenty of those over the years. And we should point out for our listeners who don't know the local area, Elton Ed Road is a road in St. Helens. And, of course, you were, you're were you from Elton Ed Road or you're from St. Helens, aren't you, in uh, Eccleston, I believe, area originally before moving away in, when you were quite young? Yeah, yeah. Oh, St. Helens, born and bred. And, and Saints, um, I mean, it's just in my DNA. You know, because I've got uh, my family, you know, all of them, cousins and sons and daughters of cousins, they're all Saints fanatics. So, you know, it's just natural that, that, that I'm a Saints fanatic. Yeah. I, I love it. And the World Club Challenge. Was was just wow, <laughs> monumental. It was probably the greatest achievement of any rugby league side in 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 our country. Huge. No That's one huge. gave us a chance against Penrith. No, no one. In fact, one journalist um, wrote because my my cousin Terry told me about it. Uh, along the lines of it's like lambs to the slaughter, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. F- Phil Gold said that Penrith would be able to declare at half time, uh, in one of his statements. You that's, know, it, that's, that's that's exactly what Terry told me. That's yeah, it, yeah. the guy that they declare at half time. Yeah, well, yeah. what I mean, what a game of rugby league that was. And then um, there was a, there was, an, there was another what excuse. A performance by the Saints. Uh, amazing performance, yeah. Top yeah I still think Absolutely the play of the game. Um, okay, they levelled. It went to the golden point, but I thought when Mark Percival took the ball out of the Ingol area, yeah, and started, Brilliant. you know, the the charge that led to Lewis Todd drop goal, I thought. Percival, there was that. I thought that was just outstanding. Yeah, it was quite a quite a pivotal moment in the game. That because had we not tackled behind our own line, it's a drop out. They're taking possession within our within our half and probably with it within our forty, and they're within kicking distance straight away. You got likes of Cleary and all them who were just going to stack up, and you know it would have been game over. It, if Percival hadn't crossed that line with that ball, it would have been a different story. Yeah, I, it was the play of the game. Yeah, I mean to be honest, it was it was the. I know our Jack scored a magnificent try. <laughs> I say our Jack, but it, we're not related. <laughs> but the whole family call him our Jack. <laughs> um, what a magnificent try that was, by the way, uh, with the move, the movement, and, and what have you. Um, but I would still say that play by Mark Percival was the, as they say in American football, the play of the game. Because ah, if he'd have got caught in the in goal area, uh, we'd have been dead and buried. Yeah. yeah. yeah I agree. think that's fair to say, wouldn't you guys? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. 100% but agree he, with you there, Elton. Yeah. He just did what he had to do to get that ball in play. Effort. It was fantastic. Yeah, and, um, and those guys by then had played 80 minutes of brutal rugby league and they'd been very close to winning in the 80 minutes. So emotionally, they must have been drained. They were physically drained. Penrith had got the backs up, they're at home, and you're having to carry a ball out your own dead ball line. You know, many people wouldn't have made that play and it just took sheer effort and determination. You know, there's not many people would have managed that, and he did. And, and you're perfectly right to say yeah. probably... Um, one of them, it, it's not 
wrong to say that that has led to them winning the game because you're right if, if he hadn't made it it probably would have been a drop goal yeah it was fair and, and of course the, the drive afterwards was to get Lewis Dodd into position to <laughs> to yeah secure the golden point I mean that also was was terrific it, we, we, we were so superior um, to Penrith who had I think I'm right in saying an 86% home record over the past three years. Twice Australian champions in the last two years. Yeah. Um, we made fewer mistakes. This is the statistics that came up. Um, it, it was just, it was just a wonderful Philip for English rugby league. And I think the reaction and um, the lack of press has been disgraceful because it, it, by an, an, an English sports team to do what they did and to get so little recognition, I think it, it has been a joke. Yeah. I noticed on Sky tonight, and I, I, I didn't even know it was on, um, but I joined it after about 10 minutes, 10 past seven or something. There was with Brian Carney um, and Paul Wellens was in there. Um, and, and they did basically a half an hour tribute to the Saints. And then the, there was what the, the two days after they, the two of them went into the um, BBC breakfast studios because I think people had got absolutely fed up that we, we weren't hailing this as one of the greatest English sports triumphs for, for, for many, many years. To touch on that is I think Saints have got a media company which have got them on to the BBC Breakfast Show. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't all that way, but I know they have employed a media company, and I think they're from Rainford, who are pushing the Saints. And I think Saints have got an advert coming out, like a TV advert. Uh, about the but BB, B, BBC uh, on the night of it, or, or well, the night after, obviously, um, they never mentioned it. BB, the, the BBC Northwest never yeah, ever on, mentioned it. On, on, on the day, Elton, I was I was travelling back from London, and on all the channels on the radio, it wasn't even mentioned. Now, what for, for, for people watching at home, or and, and if you're new to rugby league, and you, you know you, you're not sure, you know where it stacks, but. What St Helens achieved was the equivalent of an English football team winning the Champions League. And a greater, a greater yeah. achievement than and that. Sky Sports cut the coverage at the end because half time had ran over because of the storms. But if it would have been like a, a Liverpool or any other team, Liverpool or any other team in that final, they, they, they would have extended the viewing. And they would have shown them lifting the trophy. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the, one of the things is <clears throat> most of the, the, the media-controlled um, companies, whether it be the written word, broadcasting, what have you, are London-based. And I think we've learned from the London Broncos, you know, rugby league is a north a northern game. It's Lancashire, Yorkshire, Humberside. That that's all it is, and they, they don't think it matters. But we know that rugby league is the second best sport in the world <laughs> now. But they don't see it, and so they don't. Oh, you know, someone would have tapped the, the news editor of whoever on the shoulder and said, "Oh, by the way, St Helens have just won the World Club Championship." But what, what sports that then? You know, is it is it bowls? Is it darts? Is it dominoes? They wouldn't have had a clue. Shocking, really, absolutely shocking. But your um, <clears throat> your history with rugby league is deeper than just being a fan, isn't it, Elton? Because you've been involved in speaking to players and being in the dressing room before games. Going well, back that was in several 1985. Decades. <clears throat> which in, um, in St. Helens' terms is known as the Meninga season. Billy Benyon was the coach, and I, I, I went to a game very early in the season, 
and bumped into Billy and blah, blah, blah. And he said, would you, would you come down to the dressing room and meet the lads? Because, you know, I was famous. Um, and I said, well, of course I will. So I went down and met the lads um, and, and, and all the rest of them. And Billy said, we'll have to keep this going. So I went in after the game as well, which Saints had won. I can't remember who it was against, but Saints had won. Went in after the game, and uh, you know it, it was it was just a wonderful, wonderful atmosphere. Then I started going in at half time. Um, my son always came with me, but he was a bit too young for that because of the industrial language that was used. Um, but I, I felt like part of the coaching staff, you know. <laughs> me, look at me. Hey, come on. There's no way I could be a rugby league player. But we we had some fantastic times. Um, I, I, I don't know whether you guys have seen the picture when Meninga went in against Hull KR. Uh, I'm on the I, I'm on the touchline. My son's with me. Um, obviously, Benny and the coaches and all the rest. It was quite a big bench, as I remember. And I was, I, I saw where Meninga was heading, I think, before anyone else. And I stood up and punched the air like that. Get in, Mal. You know? And my son stood up next to me. And he went in and scored, the, obviously, the, the crucial try. Um but that that picture was in the St Helens Star. You, oh God, it was yeah. all over the place. It's in a book I've got, which someone has written about me. Um, really? But that that picture it has become quite iconic. It's a brilliant picture. I do know the picture you mean. It's it's an incredible picture of Big Mal, and he was big, wasn't he? Um, fantastic play, fantastic season, and uh, do you know something? What a moment to be there. Witnessing it. Do you, do you, well, and to be on the bench should be, if you like, a part of it. Yeah. Um, but Big Mal was never fit, ever. Even in the no. games he played and scored, he was never what you call 100% fit. So what, I, I guarantee did he have an that injury? because Billy Benyon and I used to discuss things you know, we discuss. Oh well, Mal's, Mal's not fit today. I don't know whether to play him or, you know, um, but he always did. Yeah, but not yeah. not a hundred percent. And when you consider what what he contributed to Saints in in eighty five, it's amazing to to to, to realise that that he wasn't he wasn't fully fit. And I just think what he was capable of if he was fit. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, crikey! Well, he started goal kicking, um, taking the responsibility off Sean Day, and but Mal was missing his kicks after Billy had said to Sean Day, "Listen, we've got the greatest goal kicker in the world here, um, so we, you're not going to be taking the, the, the you know the conversions, etc." and but Mal was missing them. So Sean Day was reinstated as the principal goal kicker. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know whether that this. was because Mal had a, a, you know, a bit of a hamstring, calf strain, which never, never left him during that, uh, during that period of time, during that uh, season he had with Saints. Yeah. But he'll always be a St. Helens legend. Oh, oh definitely, absolutely. yeah. I remember his kicking, out, and it's an interesting point, really, because I remember he kicked it an old-fashioned way, and as the Aussies used to kick the footy, as they call it, they point it towards the goal and, and toe-bung it. And uh, uh, it, it was an incredible kicker, but I remember in his early career at Saints, it really wasn't working as well as we all thought it would. So it's interesting that you raised that, that point and that you noticed it as well, and you mentioned it to... Yeah. To Billy Benyon, uh, and I do remember that. And uh, what, what a Billy, kick Billy was. was a, he was a great centre for Saints in in his time as a player. Um, I do remember that. 
Yeah. Uh, but he was a terrific coach because he he allowed players to play to do what they did best, you know. And that's it with with, well, with Mal Meninga, um, who was the best player in the world at that time. You know, it, it was like, well, what will what will Mal want to do now? So, and so the team kind of worked around what Mal wanted to do. Um, yeah. But it worked perfectly. Um, yeah. I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story. Just dawned on me. Lancashire Cup final, Central Park against Wigan. Yep, I was there. Uh, I was in the dressing room beforehand, as usual. And uh, Billy said to me, go and sit with Sean, will you? He, he looks like he's shitting himself. <laughs> Pardon the language, um, which he was. So I went and sat with Sean Day, just sort of put my hand on his leg and said, "How you doing, lad?" And he goes, "Oh, I've never been this nervous in my life," you know, kind of thing. I said, "What have you got to be nervous about?" He said, "Well, we're playing Wigan in the Lancashire Cup final, which was a big deal in those days." And I said. What the hell have you got to worry about? You've got the best outside centre in the world playing next to you. What what more do you need? Yeah. So having and they went out uh, and won, and Sean Day not only kicked a few goals, um, but he scored a try. So I'm responsible. <laughs> the Saints winning. The Lancashire Cup in 1985. We've got you to thank for that, Elton, that great win. Yeah, it's a famous win at Central Park. Yeah, Sadly, um, Central Park is no longer with us, and sadly, well, I know, I know, sadly I'm, Sean I know Day. That, but I'm just saying it was at Central Park. Yeah. I'll tell you another thing. I went to I went to Central Park once for the, I can't remember the name of the guy, a legendary Wigan coach during the, uh, era of a fire. Offia, by the way, is is his proper pronunciation. Um, Sean Edwards, you know that great Wigan team, and, and it was a great team. And I was, he had a huge marquee right over Central Park for this wonderful send off for the coach. And I I, I was doing something. Um, I think I was presenting the event, and I, I went with Stan Boardman, who was the comedian sort of thing. And I was walking around the side of the pitch, and there was a groundsman, old fella, mowing, mowing, mowing the lawn. And he said, he was in touch, you know. I said, pardon? He said, he was in touch. I said, I'm sorry, you're going to have to explain. I have not a clue what you're talking about. He said, Van Bollenhoven, 61, he was in touch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if that doesn't, uh, some, the, the, you know, the the, the rivalry it? between Wigan and Saints, I, well, I don't know what. I mean, I, there are two games I'll always watch, but I hate watching. Wigan against Saints and Liverpool against Everton. <laughs> well, we'll come on. We'll come on to the second of those derbies uh, shortly. But was was the Wigan coach Colin Clark at the time? Is that who it was in the 80, 85 season? Sorry, say that again. The Wigan coach in eighty five was it Colin Clark? No, no, no. It was an Aussie. Would it be Wayne Warren? There was John Morney came later when Martin the Fire and, and those players were around. Listen, I'll leave you guys to work that out. I can't yeah. remember the fellow's name. All yeah. I know it was. About, a, yeah, so if it was he, a fire, he won it was a, a multitude of trophies for, for Wigan. Um, yeah. You see, I, I, when it comes to rugby, I, I love rugby league. You both know that. But, you know, when it comes to knowing about, you know, individual teams, then. I, I I draw the line. Uh, Saints are the only ones I know about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To be honest, and and the the great Wigan team of Gregory Edwards, etc. Yes, obviously because they were, it was an outstanding team. Yeah. 
Okay. So how does a lad from St. Helens end up as a TV presenter on World of Sport on a Saturday and in the in the media and commentating and presenting um sports shows? How does how does that journey start for you, Elton? A lot of luck, I suppose. Um I was in the right place at the right time. My father was in the bank and we moved around. Um, we went to live in Mel's after after we left St. Helens because he, he was chief clerk of Mel's, uh, Nat West. Uh, then we went to Macclesfield where my love of football originated because we went to watch Macclesfield Town at the Moss Rose regularly. Um, in fact, once I, I was... Um, it, it, before the days of mascots, there was some something went on at the Moss Rose, and and the players came out holding kids' hands, and I came out <clears throat> holding the hand of Neil Franklin, which will mean absolutely nothing to any of you. But um, if you Google Neil Franklin, you realise he, he was one of the greatest centre halves England had ever produced. But he was ostracised from football because he went to play in Bogota. I think the first player in English history that went to to South America, wow. you know, to play professionally. It didn't work out. He came back and the FA, I think, it, I'm pretty sure it would have been the FA, said, um, sorry, you, you, you're not welcome. Um, so he had to play non-league. So anyway, that, that so, so then we moved to... Uh, from Macclesfield, we moved to, to Liverpool, Fairfield Road, uh, sorry, Prescott Road in Fairfield, uh, where my dad became bank manager. And the first week, he thought, well, he, he wanted to get me settled, obviously. I would be poor, 11 at the time. So we went to Liverpool to watch a, a game because we couldn't go to Mac. We couldn't go to the Moss Rose. And we, so we went to, um, to to Anfield, and we couldn't get in. Now, as an 11-year-old, that is a huge disappointment, as you can well imagine. And the following week, he knew, he knew a Liverpool director called Sidney Moss. And uh, he got in touch with Sid and basically said, listen, can you get us tickets for Everson? Um, next week and of course Sid did and we went in the Bullens Road end and it was Everton against Cardiff and it was April 1962 and Everton won 8-3 and I was hooked that was me I, I just fell in love with the Blues and most specifically the guy who, who ran the game offensively uh, Alex Young Wow and, and how did you then bridge that from being a fan of football to entering into commentary? Well, I, I I went I went reluctantly to um, work at the Royal Insurance, and I hated it because I'm numerically dyslexic, and it's it's all about pound shillings and pence in those days, and ah. Uh, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't wait. But my dad has set me up there. Lovely man, by the way. Oh, fantastic bloke. So they went on holiday somewhere. <laughs> At that time, I resigned from the Royal Insurance. And a very good friend of mine, Nick Davidson, his dad, Jack, was um, – he was the senior – guy at Broad Green Hospital. So he, he said, come and, you know, why don't you come and be a porter for a little while until you get back on your feet again, which I did. And I, I spent 12 months to the day at Broad Green Hospital. Absolutely loved it. It was great. Some of it was gruesome, but, you know, overall, for life experience, it was something else, terrific. And one day I was walking down one of those. There's only two corridors of Broad Green in those days. It's much bigger now. Um, I was walking down there. You know where they, they sell the, the, the grapes and the flowers for the patients? <laughs> anyway, there was a newspaper there, Liverpool Weekly News. I, I've not heard of that. 
So I, I picked up this copy of the Liverpool Weekly News, and there must have been 10 pages of sport in there. You know, from from Liverpool, Everton, right down to the amateur leagues in in uh, in, in Liverpool. So I thought I'll give this a go. So I wrote to the the managing editor, a fellow called Ron Carrington, uh, to say, uh, you know, I'm interested. Blah blah blah. So he wrote back um, to say, can you come for an interview on such and such a day at such and such a time? And I said, sorry. And by the time, so I went went for the interview. So my phone went off then. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so I went for the interview with, with Ron Carrington, who who was quite a, a kind of, you know, intimidating man. He, he really was. Um, he, you could, he had a presence, you know. And I, I always say, by the time I got home, I'd had a phone call, you know, to my, to my parents to say I got the job. It wasn't quite as quick as that, but believe me, it, it was quick. It probably was within a couple of days. Yes, we'll take you on. Wow. So I did four years at the Liverpool Weekly News as a, you know, I did the Rose Queen things, and, you know, all, all the other stuff uh, to start with. And then Ken Rogers, who was the, the sports editor, the Liverpool Weekly News, he left for the Echo. So I was put into his spot and then became group sport. And then became group sports editor, and that was Liverpool Witness and Runcorn. Uh, the Liverpool Witness and Runcorn Rugby League. Uh, weekly newspapers. Um, and after four years, after after I'd done that for four years, I loved it. Re really enjoyable. Um, I, I thought I, I thought I've got I've got a bit of a chance if I if I try for local radio. And there was no Radio City then; but there was just Radio Merseyside. So. I, I did a couple of things with Radio Merseyside, um, you know, like reading the racing results at five o'clock or something like that, alongside Bob Azurdi. Nothing, nothing fantastic. And I was in there one day, and Eddie Hemmings, who, who obviously became the voice, the face of rugby league on television, was in there. Turned from Radio City um, to become their, their sports commentator. Well, football commentator, really. Um, and I overheard this conversation. And I thought, hey, that'll do for me. So I went out of the building to, a phone, remember phone boxes? <laughs> to a phone box and rang Radio City, asked to be put through to the, the news editor and head honcho. Um, David Maker, <clears throat> and I said, you know, I'm I'm so and so 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 well groomed in in sports journalism. Uh, I've done a work on on Radio Merseyside. You know, can you consider me for a, a role? Now this was early October in 1974, and Radio City went on air on the 21st of October 1974. So within two weeks, I'd gone. And Mr. Carrington, it, he, he didn't insist on a month's notice or anything like that. You know, he just said. Um, sorry about that. Um, it's a good move for you. So go. And then I had four years commentating on football for Radio City. Um, and I suppose that the piece of commentary that grabbed people's imagination was when David Fairclough scored the winning goal against St. Etienne in um, 1977. 
and obviously the the uh, the head of sport, Paul Doherty, who became my mentor, a man I idolised, and was terribly sad when he died about three years ago. Um, anyway, he rang and said, um, "Do you want to come and work at Granada?" I said, "Well, yeah, <laughs> fine. What do you want me to do?" He said. Learned the television business, so I did, and I was, I was, I never got near a microphone or a camera for, I don't know, well over six months. Uh, and in fact, in those six months, if someone had said to me, "You you can just go back to Radio City," I would have done. But anyway, it worked out. So, so after six months, you, you get your first chance. What in front of the camera as a as a link person? It was, you know, it was roughly roughly six months. I, I, you know, I'm not saying precisely six months, but they they did a summer sports show. Um, oh, no, no, my first appearance will be about seventy eight, seventy nine, on Granada Reports, with Bob Greaves, Gordon Burns. The legendary Tony Wilson, Patty Caldwell, Bob Smith is reading the news. It was a heavyweight thing, and I was in there, you know, first time kid. I've always looked younger than I am, you know. I look like a baby compared to them. And uh, Tony Wilson introduced me. <laughs> you know, we've been searching for a new sports reporter. You know, we've looked at, and he came out with all these names of famous football people and he said but we had to settle with Elton Wellsby uh, he, he was uh, and Willow and I became great pals uh, very sad when, when he passed away and then it just progressed we had a there was a summer sports show which I think John Huntley presented and I just did reports and then it got. I got much more accustomed to to the workings of television. Well, you're working with the likes of Tony Wilson. You you become. Um, did you get sort of like rugby league action and world of sport because you know you, you said you're a you know you're a Saints fan or did, is that did that help being a Saints fan um, around that time? It it. <laughs> In a professional sense, it, it, it never really affected me at all, being, being a Saints fan. The only time it did, now this would be, oh, God, 76, something like that. Um, Saints at Wembley. I think it was against Leeds, but correct me if I'm wrong, I can't remember. And so I, I, I nominated myself not to do football, but to go to Wembley on Father's and, and do do phone reports for Radio City. And I got so into the game, I, I forgot to ring in. Seriously. I didn't report. <laughs> and, you know, because <laughs> obviously it wasn't the days of mobile phones, it was landlines. Uh, and I just got so involved, engrossed in the game. Um, I forgot what I was there for. I just thought I was there to support the Saints. I wasn't. I was getting paid to go there. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember. I, I remember that to this day. And I, you know, I, I think I got around it by by the, the the producer, Wally Scott. Where have you been? Why have you not? I've been trying to ring and I can't get through, which was a lie. I'd just completely forgotten what I was there for. <laughs> it's happened to all of us at some stage, Elton. It's definitely happened to uh, to all of us. You, over those times and those years, oh, you, you spent quite a bit of time with some of the players and you, you became friends. Who were the rugby league players that you've become friendly with and you've spent time with over in the past? Oh, it's, uh, it's a long time ago. Um, but uh, Billy Bennion, needless to say, uh, Neil Holding, Phil Vivas, um, 
they're the three that I, I really sort of got on with great. Billy especially. What a gentleman he was. Absolutely superb. Neil, um, Neil Holden was a character, wasn't he? Neil Holden, Holden was a character, yeah. Oh, he, he tipped me into the bath once. I was <laughs> fully clothed. And he tipped me into the bath. Little git. <laughs> <laughs> but you know he was holding was he was great very very accomplished at, uh, at what he did you know scrum half or, or standoff I can't, I can't remember which he wore he, number seven didn't he yeah he was more he was and more it, of a standoff but, uh, scrum half sorry he's more of a scrum half deal yeah yeah but uh, oh, he was a real character very very uh, a, a real live wire there was one there was one I wasn't there I hasten to add where Lady Pilkington, I think it was after the 85 season, I was invited, but I was working, couldn't go, through um, a party at their mansion. You know, Lady Pilkington, you know, like Mrs. Glassworks. And uh, apparently it got totally out of hand and the place got trashed. <laughs> yeah. Um, and <laughs> you know all sorts of valuable ornaments were were, were broken and what have you, and uh, that's the story that came to me. Right, <laughs> allegedly, Your Honour. <laughs> if you say allegedly, it doesn't count. That's the one. <laughs> no, really, that's one of the first things you learn about journalism. If you if you suddenly throw in allegedly to get yourself off the hook. It doesn't. It doesn't really? count. All right. No, it doesn't count. Right. Well, that's certainly good to to know, Ellen. You, you mentioned earlier that you've done a lot of the uh, after uh, dinner speaking. It, what? Who have you met on those uh, spe- speeches? Oh, on the circuit. Oh god! On that, on that circuit, well, yeah. Spud. Spud Murphy for one. Oh. Um, oh, I mean, I couldn't. We, we'd be here all night if I was to list off the uh, the people I've spoken with or been part of, and after dinner. The the, the funniest one, the funniest one I I, I recall. Well, I don't know, a bit humbling really. Um, was a West Gar- West Derby Golf Club for a, a children's hospice charity thing, and I I was being paid. Three hundred pounds to be the after dinner principal after dinner speaker. When I found out what it was, I, I just said, "No, no, no! You keep it. I, I'll do it. You keep the money." And then I did an auction at the end, and Lady Derby was there. Lady Derby, as you know, as in the Derby, um, and. I thought, oh, gosh, I've got to watch the language here. So when I got up, I asked her permission. You know, it was it was a gag, obviously, a bit of fun, um, whether I could just do my normal routine or do I take out the swear words. And she just went, oh, no, 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 carry on. So we did that, and, you know, it, 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 did, go, it did go down well. And... During the auction, she said, I will donate £200 to the charity if Elton gets his hair dyed red. And I did. And you went and did it. You got your hair dyed red. Is there any photographs of that, Elton? Yeah, yeah, there are. There are. It, it may, well, it was certainly in the Echo. And I, I've seen it in the last couple of years somewhere on, you know, Twitter or YouTube or something like that. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we'll I dig those out. Right. We'll definitely dig those out. So who were the funniest people that you did the after dinner speaking with? Any that jump out as being, uh, you didn't expect to be funny, but were? Joey Jones. Joey Jones? Yeah, ex, ex-Liverpool fullback. Full back for Liverpool in the 1977 um, European Cup final. I'd known Joey for years. Um, like when he was on 
when, when he played for Wrexham, and 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 he, he was almost monosyllabic. I mean, he didn't have any articulation whatsoever. And I did an after dinner with him. Um, oh God, ten, twelve years ago, something like that. He was absolutely brilliant. Really, very, very funny, and his delivery, a comic timing, etc. Um, if if you'd have said to me, sort of round about the, the mid seventies, who is the most unlikely person you could ever think of to deliver an after dinner speech brilliantly and make two hundred people laugh? I'd have said Joey. Fantastic. So from your sort of like commentating days and your TV presenting days. Now, I know you've with the, there's clips out there of you with um, with, with Jackie Charlton and, and people like that. Who who was who was probably one of the the, the best people that you've you've interviewed? For, be it from any sport. Well, as as a studio presenter, where you, you always have a guest, don't you? You know, it's like you two are a double act. Then you you need to find a double act. When you were uh, my my favourite was Jack Charlton, but but bar none, I, I I just um, we just got on so well. Um, we travelled the country doing, you know, kind of after dinner kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he he was he was just fantastic. Yeah. Now, now the, the clip I seen on YouTube of you and Jack, you, I don't know if there was a fan trying to get in when you was ready to go live on her. Oh, I know. Yeah. Stand. 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 The and you seem Elton to be. Elton goes mad. Is it Elton, is that right? Elton goes mad. Yeah. Yeah. No. No, well, what, was that? Was, what was, there was happening some there? Guy hurling abuse at uh, at Jack. Um, so I, I was trying to get the the floor manager, as we used to call them, a floor manager, um, to sort of get rid of him. <laughs> get out! Get out! Get him out! <laughs> and that that was it. But yeah. funnily enough, Jack was. Absolutely unperturbed about it. it. It didn't bother him in the slightest. But I, I didn't like it. I just thought it was rude. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I don't like rudeness. I mean, I'll swear with the best of them and what have you. But, but being rude for no reason, it, it's not, that's not my cup of tea. We're with you there, Elton. Our premise for this show is we just want to enjoy our guests, have some fun. We want people to feel welcome. And uh, if you enjoy it, then hopefully you'd want to join us again. That's our philosophy. So we're, we're definitely with you on that one. And uh, you, you've worked with some um, great people and you've been on some brilliant shows yourself and, and you've hit the highs of your profession. Um, we're just a small YouTube show. What tips would you give us on our small YouTube show, Helen? Oh, right. Well, to start with, I think you're doing very well. I think you, you, you bounce and one comes in, the other comes in. I think that's fine. Well, on that note, um, we're going to end it here for, for this short Rugby League section. We'll be back with Elton again, where we're going to talk about his next love, which is the, the Toffees, the, the blue team in the Merseyside, Derby, uh, Everton. But for tonight, for the Dockhouse Rugby Show and our quick look into the world of Rugby League and sporting action from the one and only Mr. Elton Wellsby. Uh, but great pleasure to have you on our show and we'll, been a pleasure. We'll catch you soon. Really been a pleasure. Don't forget, after tonight's show, leave your views in our comments section. We'd love to hear from you. The Duck House Rugby Show is proud to support the Teardrops Homeless Charity. Teardrops, supporting your community. Keith and Dave talk all things rugby league on the Duck House Rugby Show with news, match reviews and special guests from the world of rugby league. Also available in audio format as the Duck House Rugby Pod.